Kate Gordon is VP for Energy Policy at the Center for American Progress. You have her complete bio, so I won't uh, take your time reading that. Uh, as you'll see, she has a very strong personal Wisconsin connection as well, so I can think of no one better to uh, build one end of that bridge between the national policy issues and our community. Our other speaker, Matt Howard, is the City of Milwaukee's Director of Environmental Sustainability. So uh, on the other end of things, I can think of no one better positioned to tell us what's going on locally. So with that, I would invite you to help me welcome Kate Gordon. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm so impressed that people are here on Valentine's Day. I was, I, I realized it's sort of depressing. I realized very late that it was Valentine's Day today, and I thought nobody will come um, except my sister, who's here. I thought she'll be there, but anyway. So thank you all for being here. It's great to be back in Wisconsin. I grew up. We grew up in in Madison, so this is home. Um, and uh, I basically take any excuse I can possibly find to come back. So um, it, it is wonderful to be here. So I'm going to talk for a little while, and then we're going to get to have a conversation, and I hope get to have some questions from you all, because um, that's always my favorite part. So I'll try to keep this a little bit short. So I uh, work at the Center in Wisconsin, or Center, I don't work at the Center in Wisconsin Strategy. I used to work at the Center in Wisconsin Strategy at the University of Wisconsin at COWS. Um, now I work <laughs> at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. We're a national think tank. We were started by former Clinton Chief of Staff John Podesta, uh, really to be a think tank that didn't just write reports and put them on a shelf, but really put a lot of money into communications and tried to get our ideas out into the conversation. And that's uh, where we're focused. I run the energy and environment team at CAP, um, and as such do a lot of work on federal policy in particular. Um, and really on this issue of sort of what kind of economy do we want to have, what kind of energy economy in particular. Do we want to sort of go down the sort of status quo path, or do we want to get to a more diversified um, uh, and more, I think, more competitive economy? So in preparing for this trip, um, I kind of went back and did a bunch of research on Wisconsin to see where is this state when it comes to sort of which path we're taking. And you know a lot of these things already, but I, I always think it's striking. You know, I, I was saying uh, earlier, earlier to Doug and some other people, I always joke with people, um, I spend a lot of time around climate scientists, which means I spend a lot of time around people who talk about the apocalypse all the time. I don't know if you know climate scientists, but they are the most depressing people <laughs> in the world. You sit down with them and you sort of say, oh, isn't it beautiful? And they'd say, but we're all going to die when the climate gets warm. So, you know, it's like that. So I, I often talk to them about how if the apocalypse were coming and I had warning of it, I would want to be in Wisconsin because, you know, who wouldn't? You've got, with global warming, it will be warmer here. You've got the lakes. You have water supply. We have, you know, smaller farms. You could do local food. There's all these reasons you want to be here. But then if you take a step back, you realize that almost 100% of the power in the state is imported from other places. So, so if we were all here during the apocalypse, we wouldn't have any electricity um, or fuel. Uh, because it's almost entirely imported. It's almost entirely from fossil fuel sources. So uh, you know these numbers, I'm sure, but about 30% from coal, almost 30% from petroleum, interestingly, a um, lot of natural gas, some nuclear, a little bit of renewables, about 4.5% renewables. All, everything but the renewable piece of that is imported from other places. The state spends about $12 billion a year importing all that energy. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, stark. Uh, uh, so there, there, there's, there's a question sort of, do, do you want to stay on that path? Now, there is some renewable innovation going on. There's some interesting innovation uh, and new research, particularly at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. There's a new research center being built. Um, a lot of work has been done in the last 10 years or so on biomass in particular. The state is, um, although this is never, never like the, the, the most exciting sounding thing about this state, this state is very good at biomass waste. So <laughs> there's a lot of farm waste, there's a lot of forest waste, there's a lot of cow waste, there's a lot of municipal waste. <laughs> um, all that waste can be harnessed and turned into energy, and, and it's something the state's competitive in. Um, you've got, obviously, the Glacier Hills Wind Project, some, which is a great project to look at because it, most of the manufacturing and the, and the construction labor was, was domestic. So there's things happening. I mean, I think, I think there's 135, I found, uh, solar and 171 wind manufacturing firms in the state. 
um, 12,000 jobs in, in the renewable energy sector in the state. So there's, you know, it's not like nothing is happening, but you still have this imported energy issue and you still have political challenges. Um, the <laughs> anyone who read my op-ed in the Journal Sentinel on Sunday knows how I feel about um, the current governor, so I'm not gonna pull any punches by saying that the current governor has not been kind to the state in terms of moving forward with renewable energy and efficiency. Um, whether it's sort of the wind siting issues and, and whether to keep the rules on the books to make it more easy to site wind, wind farms, challenges to the state's renewable portfolio standard, um, the focus on energy attacks, uh, um, uh, sort of the things that have been in the news, the iron mining. But the other thing that I think is interesting is that while those things have been kind of cut back, there ha it's not as if the governor or the state does not have an energy strategy. So the energy strategy includes things like um, deciding to switch the Madison plant instead of from coal to biomass to natural gas. That's a strategy. Uh, the strategy includes um, massively exporting sand for, uh, to use in, in natural gas fracking process in other states. Um, the, set, the strategy includes, I mean, it is a strategy not to move forward with renewables. So you've got a, a, a sort of a, a a Wisconsin governor legislature that's sort of focused on, I would say, the status quo path, um, but a lot of potential to move on to another path. So these are really different kinds of economic growth models, and I come from an economic development background, so I tend to think of energy in an economic development context, sort of how do we look at the state, what are our strengths, how do we leverage the strengths, where do we want to go with that, what's our economic and energy future. In some ways, the questions that are happening here in Wisconsin are sort of a microcosm of the United States. So. Globally, on the positive side, uh, the United States is now the global leader in clean energy. We are the world's largest investor in clean energy, surpassing China for the first time last year. We provide a staggering 83% of the world's venture capital investment funds for clean, clean tech from the United States. We have, we're in the top three for installed renewable energy capacity. We are constantly trading places with China um, and, and Germany on that, but we're in the top three, or China and the EU. We, um, uh, and we just were surpassed by China for the first time as the best place to invest in renewable energy. So we're not, you know, the, the, the country, you often hear that we're doing nothing on clean energy. That's not true. We're leaders. Um, but we're leaders primarily because we spent two or three years um, living off of the single largest domestic spending bill for clean energy in the history of the country, which was the, the, the stimulus bill. And that's coming to an end. We're starting to see a decline in investment. And at the same time, we have a federal legislature that's committed to keeping us on a fossil fuel path. So we have a federal legislature that is committed to an extraction-based economy model where we have, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was just in a congressional hearing the other day where Anwar came up again. So Anwar is back. We're, we're back to drilling in Anwar is a, a big thing on the table. And you'll notice that in the House of Representatives' current transportation bill, the bill takes away most of the funding for transit, puts most of it into highways, and where there's a funding gap because the gas tax doesn't cover the whole bill, that is made up for by drilling in Anwar, among other things, um, drilling in the Arctic, and using the revenues from that drilling to fund the highway program. So that's kind of where we are at the federal level. Um, to me, this really points to uh, us being at a kind of a stark moment in terms of our choice on energy. We're at a place where we have to make a choice between an energy path that's a very well-defined energy path. It's being laid out for us every day by the American Petroleum Institute. It is a path where we drill offshore, drill onshore in the whole Atlantic coast, drill onshore, drill in the Arctic, um, exploit the Marcellus Shale and the other natural gas formations, exploit oil shale, and build the Keystone Pipeline. So that is a, a vision. That is a vision for the United States. And you will hear very compelling arguments about that being a way for us to do domestic production to get us off of foreign oil and create a lot of jobs. So that's one vision. The alternative vision and one that obviously we talk about a lot of CAP is a vision that's more diversified, where there's more energy choice, where yes, you're still, you, you, we can't get off fossil fuels tomorrow. This is a big part of our energy mix, but where we're starting to move much more aggressively into renewables, we're doing much more efficiency, we're doing much more innovation 
around alternatives and we're trying to build an economy and an export economy that's based on being leaders in, in that clean energy. So it's really an extraction economy and an innovation economy. This brings, I mean, you know, you know where I am on this. I, think, I do think that there are good arguments. Um, if, you, if you sort of take the whole thing on its face and you just say, what do we care about? All we care about is jobs on one side or the other. There's very good arguments to be made on both sides. If you say, what do we care about? We care about independence from foreign oil. There's very good arguments to be made on both sides. But if you add in uh, things like environmental impact and global warming and the quality of jobs and America as a global leader and competitor, it's actually, you actually hit, um, end up very much on the side, I think, of a clean energy path. So let's take as, as, a, as, a, as an assumption that we want to go that way, that, that, that we sort of want to choose the alternative energy path. What's the role of the government or the public sector in getting us there? Does the public sector have a role? Um, taking a step back, what's the role of the public sector in general? Um, we have, in general, in this country, been very comfortable with the public sector having a large role sort of at the beginning of the value chain. So let's say that you kind of start, and I'll do it from your direction. You start over here with early stage research and development. You invent an idea. You're at a lab, you're at a university, you invent something. Moving into commercialization, and then you move into manufacturing and, 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 and mass manufacturing. Installation, let's say with big systems, operating and maintenance. It's kind of the path of a technology. We've all always been very comfortable with government intervention over here. Early stage R&D, very bipartisan still, in, in, even in Washington where nothing is bipartisan, early stage R&D is bipartisan. The federal labs don't get their budgets cut very much. We get less and less comfortable as you go over here because the market is supposed to take over more and more of a role, right? The closer you go to the market and commercialization, the more market takes over. The problem is with that model is that there are areas in which there are market failures and the market doesn't take over. Um, and there are areas in which the public interest dictates that we should have a role and take over and help the market um, where, where there's market failure. So examples of market failures, um, which are rife in the clean energy context, um, let's, you know, your externalities of your technology are not being capitalized. So you have a coal plant. So we're, the coal plant is way past um, early stage R&D. But let's say you have a coal plant. Um, and it's going along and it's market ready and the utilities want to pay for it and they pass through the cost of the ratepayers and it's all taken care of by the market. But the cost that you as a ratepayer are paying for that coal doesn't take into account the health impacts on your community, doesn't take into account carbon pollution, doesn't take into account potential impact on global warming. If it did, it would be much more expensive. If it did, the market would probably say coal is actually not cheaper than renewables, we should take a second look at renewables. But because coal doesn't encompass those costs, it will always be cheaper. So it's very, very hard to compete with unless you are natural gas, which currently is sort of the new, the new cheap technology, which the, 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 the impacts of natural gas fracking and of methane leakage are not currently captured in the cost of natural gas. So you have these technologies that don't capture extra externalities. So the market is not dealing with those well. You have the fact that coal, oil, now natural gas, have benefited from a government, they, they actually have benefited from government intervention for a long time. So the oil and gas industries have gotten uh, $4 billion or so, in, to four to seven billion, depending on how you count it, in subsidies every year since, since 1904. Um, and that's, you know, those are subsidies that help their business model. Um, and that helped them to be competitive, even though the oil and gas industries made uh, record profits last year, I think $137 billion in profits in 2011, which is the highest ever um, for that industry. So you have long-term subsidies that give them a leg up in, on, on cost competitiveness. You have, whereas the renewables don't, you know, don't have a built-out infrastructure, don't have the same subsidy support. You have, um, again, the infrastructure that's already been built out. So you have these market failures. And then you have a public interest, I would argue, a public interest in having government engaged in clean energy rather than on the fossil fuel side. Even if you didn't have all these market failures, you have the fact that uh, fossil fuels, um, by and large, uh, you know, have climate impacts, have health impacts, have environmental impacts. And then I would argue um, that staying on a sort of an extractive and fossil fuel eco economic model is not good for us in terms of our long-term economic future and competitiveness. So we have a national interest in going the other direction. Let's assume that. What role should government have in that, and should government sort of take over? No, no one is arguing that. 
even if you have government intervention in the form of, say, a re renewable energy standard, which is a government intervention. Um, we have one in Wisconsin. It says 10% of the power in the state sold by utilities has to come from renewable sources. We have no national energy standard like that, but 30 states have those standards. That's, that's a government intervention. Or you could have um, the production tax credit for wind that helps people put uh, up wind farms. That's a, that's a government intervention. Or the much discussed Department of Energy loan guarantee program, uh, which none of you had ever heard of, I guarantee, until a year ago. And then when the Solyndra thing happened, now you all know what it is. Um, the Department of Ener Energy loan guarantee program that funded Solyndra is a government intervention. Um, those are not intended to take over the market. We are not a country that, um, except for in the Defense Department, we're not a country that sort of takes over a market and fully funds it. Uh, what those are intended to do is to send a market signal that something is a good investment for the private sector. And all of those things I just mentioned have driven private investment. So uh, I'll give a close to home example, Focus on Energy. Focus on Energy is a program, as you know, that does energy efficiency in homes and businesses around the state. It's currently, I think, underfunded or unfunded? Underfunded. Um, Focus on Energy has leveraged twice as much money in terms of savings as, it, as any money that's gone into it. It has, you know, the money goes into it, a dollar goes into it, and, and, and consumers get $2 of savings out of it. The um, 1603 investment uh, tax credit program that um, Mark Newman used, for instance, for his solar business, has leveraged enormous amounts of private investment. What that program has allowed uh, solar companies to do is to get grants to do essentially big solar projects, sort of startup solar companies, and then they've invested their own money on top of the grants, and, and it's leveraged a, a fair amount of money. Uh, the loan guarantee program that funded Solyndra um, has invested $4 billion dollars over the life of the program, um, and it has gotten, gotten back, um, I believe, almost $37 billion in terms of the, the amount of, of, of private money leveraged. So Lindra itself is a great example. You know, private investor, investors, including the Waltons who run Walmart, put in over a billion dollars into Solyndra. It wasn't that the government thought it was a good bet and everyone else thought it was a stupid bet. It was that that many people bet on Solyndra, and the government was one of those people. And like the other people who bet on it, the government lost out. So these things have always leveraged um, a fair amount of private money. That's a big role for the, 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 the public sector. The Recovery Act, the, the, uh, the stimulus bill, um, you know, over the life of the program created you know, several million jobs, um, increased our GDP, reduced unemployment. So the, uh, the Weatherization Assistance Program weatherized 600,000 homes. $2 billion in savings to those consumers. So these things are not intended to replace the market. They're intended to spur the market, and I think that's important. And it has, in fact, worked in the green energy sector. States like Michigan, well, actually overall, during the depth of the recession, the only industries that significantly grew jobs during the recession were clean energy industries. So whereas the economy as a whole grew at a very, very sluggish rate in the depth of the recession. Green energy industries grew at about 8.3% at the same time. So these, this is a, actually a bright spot in our economy, despite what you might, might have been hearing. So we'd argue, you know, there's a public interest in funding these jobs, in funding these programs. There is a, uh, uh, there's a market failure. Um, there's a need for the government to be involved in some way. Another important point is that, um, and this gets to the foreign policy part of this conversation, is that other countries are investing in these industries. It's not as if we sort of, we're making a decision as a country whether or not to get involved in clean energy, and if we don't invest in it, it's going away. So if, if we don't invest in clean energy industries, they fail, right? The rest of the world is taking this bet. The rest of the world is already moving ahead. China is now has double the installation of renewable energy to the United States. Um, China makes 50% of all wind and solar components in the world, which is just amazing, right? I mean, and that's, you talk about China three years ago and that wasn't true. This is huge. China is trying very hard to move into the innovation side of the clean energy economy where we've traditionally been leaders. So China is has very targeted programs now to bring U.S. scientists to China, researchers. Um, the last Chinese delegation of the former uh, of uh, um, Prime Minister, uh, Chairman, I guess, he's a chairman, uh, brought, he brought 150 people with him on his last state trip to, to, uh, to the United States, most of whom, almost 100 of whom, spent their time 
going to our national labs, scoping out, te out technologies, and, and it convincing people to commercialize back in China. So China has a strategy. Um, Germany and the EU, if you don't like China as a comparison, I, every time I go to the um, Hill and testify on this stuff, someone in the House side always says, you keep talking about communist China. And why do you keep talking about communist China? So then I say, well, I'll talk about you know, socialist Europe instead. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and Germany, you know, Ger which, is, which is closer. Um, Germany has, uh, uh, the EU as a whole has, has passed comprehensive policies to push um, uh, clean energy. And Germany has become a world leader in solar. You've all heard this. Germany doesn't have that much sun, but they're a world leader in solar because they made a decision to invest in the technology. Um, Germany and China are, and the EU in general and China are interesting because what they've done, how they got to where they are, is not because the um, magic of the market worked differently in those, in those countries. It's not because clean energy is sort of, uh, I, I, don't, I mean, it is, it is cheaper, and I'll explain that in a second, but it, it wasn't a magic market thing. It was because both, com both places have comprehensive public strategies, public policy strategies to make this happen, and they have them in a couple ways. The EU and China and actually sort of everywhere, I mean, Brazil, India, um, everywhere but here, Japan, have, have visionary policies that set goals so that clean energy will start to take over a bigger and bigger share of their energy mix. China has a renewable energy standard at the national level and, as of recently, has a price on carbon. The EU signed the Kyoto Protocol and has a 2020-20 strategy where 20% of all energy, 20% of energy is supposed to be renewable, 20% more efficient, and 20% lower carbon by 2020. I think the EU's policy is significant because what they've said is sort of like the United States. What they've said is, look, we're the EU. We're not any one country. But we want to set this overarching 2020 strategy. You countries, you figure out how to get there. Denmark, if you're good at offshore wind, you do yours with offshore wind. The UK, if you want to do you know, coal to biomass, you do coal to biomass. Um, Germany, if you want to do solar, every country is able to reach that goal in a different way, and every country can use efficiency to some extent to reach the goal. It's been wildly successful, and Denmark is actually on, on course to get to 100% uh, renewal um, by 2050, if not earlier, so, which is kind of amazing. The price on carbon has been huge. The Kyoto Protocol, although in international treaty terms has not been that strong of a document. The countries that signed the Kyoto Protocol have had 20% more innovation in terms of new patent filings in clean tech than the countries that didn't sign. And that's very significant because the United States is generally a leader in patent innovations and we didn't sign and we have actually dropped back because we don't have that incentive to go toward lower carbon technology. So, these countries have set high-level policies, and then they've set very targeted policies underneath that. So China has its five-year plan, 9.5% of the energy to come from renewable sources by 2015. But then under the, and then China also has underneath that very specific goals to manufacture these technologies, to in innovate these technologies, manufacture these technologies, export these technologies, and use the technologies, and use its own country, which is formidable and big, as the first and primary market for these technologies. So what China does is says, we will pass a law about carbon emissions from autos. That will lead people to want to buy lower carbon vehicles. At the same time, we will invest in low carbon vehicle manufacturing and in workforce training for people to make low carbon vehicles. We'll use our market as the first primary market to sell into and then we'll export to the rest of the world. And that sounds very demand, command and control and top down, but Germany does something very similar. Uh, combines targets, with a targeted manufacturing and workforce strategy, a domestic demand strategy, and then turns it into an export strategy. Here in the United States, we call that picking winners and losers. And uh, we don't do it at the, at the federal level, or we say we don't do it. Um, we do it in a couple of very key places, which are, interestingly, the leaders in clean energy innovation. One of them is the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is, is, is famous for picking winners and losers. The Department of Defense decides it wants a technology, gets a contractor to invent it, gets another contractor to build it, gets another contractor to use it all over the place in military installations, and then commercializes it. What's the best example of that, right? The internet. I mean, everyone talks about it. The internet started, it starts as DARPAnet, becomes commercialized, um, gets uh, much, a lot of pri private investment once the government has committed a market and done a lot of the early R&D, becomes the internet, now huge, you know, got us out of the last recession. 
Um, the microwave was invented by NASA. Many people don't know that. Um, solar panels, famously, invented by NASA and then commercialized overseas. And now we buy them back. Um, the slinky, my favorite DOD technology is the slinky. But um, I put that in my original draft of the op-ed and my communications people made me take it out. I was like, the slinky. Wisconsin people love slinkies, but it didn't, it didn't work. Um, I think it was like a spring in an aerospace factory or something. Um, but so the DOD is a great example. DOD has kind of looked at this problem worldwide and said, we have a huge national security problem if we don't do something about our energy system. We have a failing power grid here in the United States. If that grid gets attacked, that's very centralized, very few power stations. If those get attacked and we have blackouts on our bases, that's a national security problem. So the Department of Defense is the world leader now in investing in new innovations in, the micro, in microgrid technology. So individual small grids for smaller sort of community scale grids, they're doing them on their bases. They're trying to get their bases to be net um, zero energy users. They're using their, the land around their bases, a lot of which is used for military exercises, but not all, for renewable energy installations and for test beds for the private sector to try out new technologies. So the, the military is really going ahead on this. And I think that's significant because first, we like the military and we think they're probably smart about you know, um, um, security threats. But second, because they are, they are in fact picking winners and losers, but they're doing it with a very specific sort of public interest in mind, and they're doing it in a place where the market isn't, isn't adjusting. And I think, I think that's important when we sort of think about what the government role is. One more example I'll give of where I think that the public sector role has been effective, um, and it's not a military example, um, but it's an example of, of, of where we've been effective in sort of moving a technology forward and being competitive internationally is, is vehicles. And vehicles are an interesting example because that's a really interesting combination of different types of government intervention. We um, set fuel economy standards. And the fuel economy standards, uh, for those who follow, those geeky people who follow things like regulatory uh, processes, um, fuel economy standards were interesting in that the industry was at the table to develop those standards, much more than they usually are. You had the car companies actually engaged in developing the standards. Um, the fuel economy standards combined with the high gas prices in 2008 really led the car companies in the United States to become much more aggressive about trying to find alternative lower fuel technologies. Um, what they did was a classic, again, sort of economic development strategy of building on what we were already good at. What they built on U.S. manufacturing and on skilled workers in Detroit, you know, primarily. Not all these things are happening in Detroit, but Detroit, you'll find any car company you look, like, look at, including places like Tesla, which are very California-focused, has a Detroit person in it somewhere doing the operational, operational support. So they looked at where are we good, we have the skilled people, we have a manufacturing force, we have these standards, so we, and we have a giant market for cars here in the United States. We have an enormous domestic market. So what can we do? We, we can build, to, and we have high gas prices, and all these people coming in wanting to get rid of their Hummers and, and buy smaller vehicles. The U.S. Uh, industry was therefore very far ahead on, on um, electric cars and electric drivetrains, and we are now exporting electric drivetrains to China, among other places. Um, Coda Automotive is a car company, interesting company, kind of a, a symbol of the modern economy. They're a California company, but they did a strategic partnership with a Chinese battery company called Li Shen Battery, which makes a lot of computer batteries. And they're building the cars in China, but they're importing two things from the United States, the drivetrains, the electric drivetrains, which we're very good at. And this is sort of interesting, another regulatory thing. The, the steel that's in the um, part of the car that's between the passenger and the, the, the front and the back doors on the side of the car. Because the U.S. has very strong um, rules about crumple zones for cars, and if you're hit on the side in the U.S., you can't crumple inward. The car can't crumple inward on the side. So that steel between the two doors has to be extremely strong. It's high tensile steel. We manufacture and shape it and sell it here, and we ship it to them to meet the safety standards for the U.S. market. So that's a great example of kind of a combination of regulation, driving innovation, uh, putting the US, is, uh, U.S. in a competitive position and ultimately getting us to a lower carbon um, uh, a set of technologies. And I, I, I think it's a great one because, in particular, because all you hear these days in Washington is that we can't do regulation because it, it kills jobs. And that's sort of a nice example of what happens when the private sector is pushed to innovate. 
um, and, and, uh, and do new technologies. So I'll wrap you up in a second, but I, I'll just say sort of where, where are we now? Sort of where's the, where's the hope um, for, for how to move forward on this stuff? Um, a Representative Henry Waxman, who used to be the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and you may know if you follow carbon legislation, was one of the authors of the Waxman-Markey bill, which was the cap and trade bill that did not pass um, uh, out of Congress a couple years ago. Waxman came to speak at my organization, and one of the things he said really, really resonated with me. He said, I've been in Congress 30 years, and I have never seen before a situation where energy is completely moved from being a regional issue to a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. He sort of said, the minute you talk about energy or clean energy, you've be, it's become a partisan conversation. We are a complete stalemate in Washington on this stuff. It's almost impossible to talk about it, um, which is incredibly frustrating for those of us who want to move forward. I think there's a couple, in terms of federal legislation, a couple places we can go. There's things that you can do without Congress, and uh, we're certainly looking at a lot of those, and the Department of Defense is a big place for that, but federal government is a large purchaser of vehicles and energy, and the federal government could be a much more uh, proactive, sort of you know, use its purchasing power more proactively. Um, there are some regulatory things that we could do to make it easier for people to develop clean energy systems, the agencies could do more to sort of do competitions for regions to kind of invent the next best X thing, energy storage. But there's only so much that you can do um, at the executive le branch level. Legislatively, I'm afraid we're looking at a pretty tough year. Um, the, 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 again, we have things that are bipartisan like early stage research and development, but even those things are getting hard to get out the door in this current Congress. Um, there's a clean energy standard that's been put on the table by the Senate, but most people don't think it will go anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, the Solyndra conversation has really, has sort of focused everyone's attention away on, uh, on, on sort of the negatives of government interven intervention. So, but that's not to say that people aren't trying. And, and something I think that's encouraging is that the president's budget that he just put out yesterday, the 2013 budget actually does try to really strike a note of us getting onto a better energy, better energy path. It attempts to balance some of these priorities. One of the most important thing it does, and one of the most publicly popular things it does, is to take away the $4 billion a year in oil and gas subsidies, um, and to put that money actually specifically into domestic manufacturing, which I thought was a nice move. That's an interesting um, uh, thing. Th those subsidies, taking away those subsidies is the single most popular thing you can do on energy, if you look at public polling. Um, and we can't get it done, uh, because you, you can imagine why we can't get it done. The people who'd benefit from them are the people who fund the campaigns during campaign years. Um, but he takes those away, puts it into domestic manufacturing, um, uh, puts a, a fair amount of money into the 48C program, which is a program to help manufacturers retool and become part of the clean energy supply chain, reinstates the production tax credit for wind and solar, um, puts a, a fair amount of money, uh, actually has quite a large increase in the DOE, in the Department of Energy Research and Development budget, does a lot on energy efficiency and building technologies, and significantly, and this is a public sector thing that you can do without Congress, uses public lands as sort of a text testing ground for scaling up renewables. So solar zones on public lands, um, uh, ocean planning that allows for offshore wind in designated zones, and then sort of does sort of more, more uh, what they call marine spatial planning in the oceans. Um, National Oceans Policy, um, asks for a definitive study on the greenhouse gas impacts of, of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. So the budget really tries to get at this, and I think the president is trying to sort of make a statement about us getting on, on the right path. I am not confident that Congress will do anything but that budget, but it is a nice marker out there. Um, meanwhile, I, I think, and you'll hear a lot more from that, but I think you know states and cities are really trying to make up for the lack of federal leadership and you know, move forward in areas, and, and in some ways it's easier at the local, not easier, but, but it makes sense at the local level, because people sort of, at the federal level, this is all a big macroeconomic conversation that doesn't feel like it touches people. At the local level, you're talking about people's actual energy bills. You're talking about where does their power come from. You're talking about, you know, do they have a choice this summer when gas prices go over $4 a gallon for more than two months, which they're expected to do. Um, so at the local level, I think that you can really have a conversation about choice and energy diversity and sort of bringing these things back to people um, and, and bringing, honestly, where I think we need to go, bringing energy back away from that partisan scale, back to being a regional and a local issue, back into the hands of people um, where they live, 
and, uh, and really kind of doing classic economic development again and saying, you know, what are we good at in Wisconsin, right? We're good at these things. We have these natural resources. We're good at these things. We can leverage those, and we can be leaders. Um, in this part of the country and other parts of the country, we can be leaders um, across the clean energy economy. We don't need to go back to an old model of economic growth where we dig up our land and sell the stuff that's underneath it. We actually have another choice. So with that, I will leave you and go up to the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kate. And uh, Matt, maybe you could uh, start our conversation off with uh, a little bit of background on your office sort of, and what was the sort of policy decision that led to its creation? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the background on their office is it's been around for about four years now, and it's actually a direct outgrowth of uh, Mayor Barrett. When he came into office in 2004, uh, he reached out to the community and uh, asked for the community's assistance in developing some recommendations for the city on ways that the city could be more energy efficient, could develop a smarter energy policy, and something that's really important, obviously, to us here in Milwaukee is, is better use our water resources and better manage our stormwater uh, runoff, which has a big impact on the sewage system and on the lakes and rivers. And so this group came together. He called them the Green Team. And uh, they made a series of recommendations uh, to the mayor, about 40 recommendations back in 2005. And there were a number of fills a laundry list of, of things that the city could do. But overarching that, uh, they suggested creating an office of environmental sustainability to help the city and the community work together uh, to identify what's our strategy moving forward and addressing our energy issues and stormwater issues, um, and then work to implement that with city hall budgets. And so in 2006, the first director was appointed, and then I came on board in, in 2010. And um, you know, we spend a lot of time, especially as it relates to taxpayer dollars, looking at how we're using those dollars to pay our energy bills. Um, our primary energy bill on our facilities and buildings is about $10 million a year. And over the past five to six years, we've been very systematic about making energy efficiency improvements to city hall facilities and have ended up shaving about a million dollars off our electric bill on just, on just our buildings and facilities. That doesn't count our fleet and it doesn't count uh, our water utility, which uses a lot of energy to, to clean and purify and distribute water. So, you know, that, that's one of the ways we kind of bring it home to, to Milwaukeeans, to, to taxpayer dollars, to be good stewards of that money, but also to be good stewards of the environment, which is really, as, again, as we know here in Milwaukee, it's, it's an economic asset. This city was built on water. Uh, water fueled our industries, it fueled our transport, and so to the extent that we want to main, maintain our competitiveness here locally and with our industries that we have, you know, we, we need to protect those natural resource, uh, resources and, and again be good stewards of that. Well, one of the central questions both at the, the national level, and I, I'd be curious to hear your take on how it plays out at home, is the extent to which there's a, a public investment role in spurring <coughs> private sector activity. Is, is uh, the city doing anything along those lines? Yeah, I mean, just to step back and kind of, you know, get back to some of the points that Kate was making. Um, you know, clearly, you know, when it comes to environmental issues, I always say follow the money and follow the military. I mean, mm. that's truth. You know, I mean, we can debate religion and philosophy, but if you follow the money in this country and if you follow the military, then you know, it gives you some basis of reality. And if you've got the Department of Defense as one of the largest and biggest leaders and innovators right now in the, industry, in, uh, in the energy field, um, you know, that says something. If you look at Walmart, and you can blow people's minds when you say that Walmart and DOD together are basically leading, you know, environmental sustainability uh, yeah. in the United States. And it's true because they have such a huge footprint, but they've also found value from that. And so if you, again, follow that money, follow the military, the DOD created an Africa command in the past two years, uh, primarily to address threats from climate change in Africa because they saw that as a destabilizing factor and force in, in our national security policy and international policies. So, you know, that's, that's real. So bring it down to Milwaukee. It's, it's the same situation. Kate mentioned that we're sending about $12 billion a year out of state on fossil fuels. That's a portion of that, if not all of that, we could be using on producing cleaner energy and technologies here uh, in the state, in our region, uh, to power our city, to power uh, our communities. And again, it's, it's 
it's really a strategic issue and it's a competitiveness issue. And if you have agreement uh, at the federal level or state or local level, and you agree as policymakers that that's going to be your strategy, um, then it's clearly in line uh, with United States history to, to have the government involved in some way in working with those industries. In fact, I think 1789 was the first time uh, that we uh, put a tax or a tariff on British coal to support domestic coal production in the United States. So, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous for people to say that, you, you know, the, the government hasn't been involved yeah. when, when the case is we've been involved from the very beginning. It's just to what extent and is there an actual policy or strategy that we're supporting? So, oh, I just want to add really quick to that. It, it, it also, I think, is important to remember that when we've done that historically, it hasn't always worked from the very beginning. I mean, a, a big example of government intervention for what we considered a national purpose and competitiveness was the, the, the moon shot, um, the moon program. We all know what happened to Apollo 1, but that didn't stop Apollo, all the further Apollos. They, you know, we, we, we don't stop. One of the things about the cylindric conversation that's been so frustrating to me is that we've never stopped trying to achieve a public purpose just because there is there's there, there there's sort of early failures of technology or of or of uh, early bets that don't work out. We have always sort of continued on to figure out where the right bets are. So how did this politicization of what should be sort of a, a ideologically neutral yeah. debate really occur? I mean, how how did uh, this process that Henry Waxman described to you? really take place? Well, people always ask, you know, we, we get a lot of visitors from other countries at CAP and they always say, what is going on with you people? You know, why, why, this is such a common sense thing to do and it's, you know, it's, you're falling behind in your sort of global leadership role. I think there's a, a couple different, uh, different answers to that question. I mean, one is sort of the other side of the follow the money point, which is there is just an enormous amount of fossil fuel money in the political process in this country. It's a, uh, um, and unlike a lot of money that goes into the political process, fossil fuel interests are very skewed in where they give their money. You don't see a lot of hedging bets between the two parties. It's actually pretty focused on the Republican Party. Um, if you just look at the pure numbers um, of, of where the donations go. Uh, I think that's also true because energy is, in fact, a regional issue, and a lot of the oil and gas in industries are in areas that have been, tended to go more Republican. So you, there's a reason, part of the reason for that. But you also have um, uh, the fact, I mean, the bottom line in this country that makes us different from all the other countries that I talked about that are sort of beating us on innovation and, and, uh, and commercialization is that we have not yet been able to resolve the global warming question. And every single country that we're competing with on these technologies has had that conversation. Even China has had that conversation. Um, Europeans come and visit us and they're sort of amazed that we can't get past that point. And I think there's a lot of different reasons we have a hard time getting past it, but um, it, it's, it's, I did a little sort of informal study of the countries that have, 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 have gotten beyond global warming um, as, as sort of, you know, whether it's real or not. And all of them are either parliamentary systems or command and control um, systems. So uh, every country that's a democracy that's had that conversation had a Green Party essentially, that started it, that, be, that brought it to the table and used it as a wedge to, uh, move, to kind of, you know, move toward political consensus on some other issue. Uh, we haven't been able to have that, and, and the closest thing we have to the Green Party is probably the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which is the, what we consider to be the left wing of the Democratic Party, very marginalized in the two-party system. So that's an interesting question, is how do we get there? Um, and uh, And... I don't know the answer, but I am, I'm increasingly convinced that part of the answer is bringing this DAC back to a local level again and really having this be a bottom-up conversation where local impacts inspire people to, to kind of make it a national priority. I just don't know if we can do it top-down. Well, and Matt, what about that? What, what would a, a national energy policy do in terms of your office? I mean, would that change anything? Well, I think so. I mean, if we had... I mean, it would be nice to have a policy in general. Um, business abhors, you know, a policy vacuum. And so that's a major issue off, right off the bat. So businesses are reluctant to make investment decisions, whether that's nationally or here in Milwaukee. 
Um, so if we had that national policy, then hopefully your state and, and your local municipalities would then align themselves, like the example that Kate used with the EU and the different countries using different strategies to meet their, their uh, portfolio standard. Um, I think it would have a, a huge impact uh, locally uh, in terms of, of how we're sourcing our, our energy here in Wisconsin. So. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite you to, to sort of queue up behind the mic if you've got a question. But uh, while, while that process is taking place, Kate, uh, what about the, how, how far away from that conversation are we, really? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I actually have hope. I know it doesn't sound like I do, but I, I do. I have hope. Um, uh, in, in, again, this sort of bottom-up political process. I, something that we've, I've seen a couple times happen nationally and I, I'm always sort of encouraged by is that you'll hear the sort of partisan political statement coming on the, on the floor of the Congress. So Cliff Stearns, I don't know if you know him, he's from Florida, he's a big anti-clean energy guy. Cliff Stearns gets on the floor and he says, um, we shouldn't even try, you know, forget all these green jobs people, we shouldn't even try to compete with China because they're already doing it, we should just buy stuff from them and keep doing our natural gas and, you know, that's where we're, we're leaders. So he, so he said, you know, we can't compete with China and a lot of people argued with him. In his district in Florida are at least three companies that manufacture renewable energy systems of different kinds. So next time he's down in Florida, my office and some other people get those guys to go to the town hall mm -hmm. and ask questions and say, oh, you said this thing, but are you saying that we shouldn't exist? Are you saying the 300 jobs at my factory are not real jobs? Are you saying we should leave the state of Florida and go to China? <laughs> he retracts, he retracts because it's his district, it's his constituents and they are job creators in his district. So he backs down from his, state, his statement and the next event he does down in Florida is at a solar company. So that to me is striking, right? Um, governor Kasich in, in Ohio, similar story campaigns for governor on getting rid of the state renewable energy standard, gets in office, he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's elected, he's waiting to you know, take office. The um, coalition of business people from Toledo go to see him and they say, by the way, the only reason Toledo has an economy is that we were able to transform our glass manufacturing plants into solar manufacturing plants. You might want to reconsider that RPS thing that you said and he backs off, he changes it, he doesn't do it when he gets into office. Even Governor Walker, um, gets out there all hot on getting rid of the wind siting rules, has not done it yet. Part of why people think that is because he's been getting visited by wind industry people. So I think that when you get it to this local level and when people are talking to their constituents and we're, when you're talking to job creators and workers, it's very hard to maintain that partisan position. So I guess the question is, I do think it's changeable, but I don't think it's changeable by national advocacy groups, I think it's changeable by a bottom-up, industry-driven in particular, um, uh, uh, real constituent strategy. 